Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guest today is Kelly Bird. Kelly, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Mitchell Cruz. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. You gave a message recently about four viruses that kill mm. organizations, and I want to talk about that uh, today mm. because you applied it not only to businesses mm. and organizations, but churches and families as well. Yeah. Four viruses. Yeah. The first one is resistance. Do you want me to read the Bible verse that went with it? Sure. Second Kings 17, 14, but they would not listen and were as stiff-necked <laughs> as their fathers who did not trust in the Lord their God. Yeah. So it looks like resistance follows or flows from a lack of trust in God. Yeah. Yeah, there's a that's a it's a stubbornness. Yes. And, and usually stubborn is tied to, I'm not sure what's on the other side. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the dog won't come with you because it's just in it, whatever. But a lot of times it just doesn't know where you're taking it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So yeah, the resistance thing is, and, and, and I'll just say this, before we jump into one, the virus discussion just at the outset, it's interesting for me as I work with companies and organizations, uh, and I remember from our, you know, our ministry days as well. Some, some organizations just don't want to talk about that. Sometimes you have to have the conversation before this conversation that just helps organizations realize uh, it's just not as healthy as it could be. It's mm. just not as healthy as it, as it should be. There really are some things that aren't quite right. And when you and I think about that and talk about that, we know that's just like commonplace. Yeah. But yet people want to resist this idea that they're sick. It's almost an admission of... It's an admission of the, fault. It's yeah. an admission of weakness. It's an admission that they missed something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, you and I say, no kidding. Of course you, you know, of course you are, because no one's got this thing dialed in just right. So mm -hmm. I'm just thrilled when anybody wants to have this conversation, because I have found that these things are present almost everywhere I go. And resistance is... Yes, resistance is, you, you're trying to lead, you've established a mission, a direction, and there will always be people at high levels, at mid levels, at low levels, who basically just say, heck no, I'm not, I'm not going. One author says that we spend our lives either promoting or protecting. And I see both of those yeah. as resistance in a way. So like, if, if you're always promoting, you're not going to want to admit that there's a problem right. or admitting the, what you're talking about, the, the bigger idea of the virus is admitting that there might be viruses yeah. um, because you're promoting and that would, that would act like there's something wrong. Right. And then the protecting, you sure don't want to yeah. uh, say anything about a weakness there either. Yeah, no, it's true. They're afraid. They're not sure. They like where they're at. And you say, or we say, we're going this direction and heels just heels get dug in, and it's just it's just not going to happen. The Hebrew language has five levels for fool, and it's a progression, uh, a hardness of heart. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts out kind of like uh, loose sand, and ends up as cured concrete. Right. But the third level of the five levels is stubborn, and it is where resistance. Yes. starts. The first two, um, right. simple and stupid, you're just, you're kind of gullible and you're just making the same mistakes all over again. But yeah. boy, when stubborn sets in, man, things change in a hurry. Yeah. When you think about kids and you think about parenting and you think about leading in a home, you know, that's why we didn't do it perfectly. We made lots of mistakes, but we just tried really hard when they were young to get them to understand that we did love them. We knew a little bit more than they did. And when we said, we're going to go here, let's go. We're going to go. And, and again, as we've talked about in the past, early on, because we said so, later, as they got older, because they wanted to, because now they trusted us. Yeah. But that's really important at a very young age or at the beginning of your company or when you're a startup or when you first get a chance to reshuffle the deck and have a new team. This idea of, you know what, we're going to all cooperate with each other and we are going to work together. This resistance thing, it really is a virus. It really is deadly. It really can destroy you. Have you ever experienced resistance in a church? Yeah. 
Co- yeah, a couple times. So sometimes, yeah, sometimes because of, you know, almost because it was my fault. I, I sometimes I didn't cast the vision very well. A lot of times, sometimes because I think I bumped into stubborn people who maybe didn't want to, you know, didn't want to do some things. And you can battle, argue, debate all you want, you know, on kind of who's right or who's wrong. It, it's not really a right or wrong deal. It's just, do you trust me? And will you walk with me? And let's see if we can't get this thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, sometimes that's hard. I, I think especially if a church wants to be outreach-oriented, yeah. um, there just seems to be a tension that'll come up, whether you're going to really go outside these four walls mm-hmm. and reach new people and meet them where they are, yeah. or do you want it to be a little bit more of the same uh-huh. uh, haven and protection yeah. for the same people? I get it. Um, Jeremiah 7.24, but they did not listen or pay attention. Yeah. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. Man, that's powerful. Yeah. So not listening, not paying attention. Mm-hmm. These are, would be characteristics of being stubborn. Uh, there's a hardness of heart there. Yep. Saying evil. That's the uh, fourth progression of being a fool. Uh, and they went backward. Yeah. Can I say something about that? Yeah. So the... The amazing thing about what you just said there, read that one more time. But they did not listen or pay attention. Didn't listen. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They were predisposed. Yep. And they went backward, not forward. Didn't listen, predisposed, going backwards. Yeah. So so when I talk about resistance, people say, oh, so you don't want any tension. And I go, no, 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 no. I didn't say that. I, I like tension. And there's tension when... Like you're open to this thing and we're having a really honest discussion and you're listening and considering and I'm listening and considering and the tension that comes when you might not see it the way I, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. That like what you just read, that's not healthy tension. No. We're not even listening to you. That's resistance. That's a virus that'll kill a family, kill a church, kill a company. Absolutely. Second virus of four that kill organizations is silence. Yeah. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The words that are supposed to come out of our mouths um, are wholesome, building up others. So he's juxtaposing um, unwholesome with building up. So unwholesome tears down. Yep. And that includes uh, silence when you ought to speak. Right. 27 years of, you know, work in the nonprofit ministry world, you know, five whatever years, you know, on the corporate side. Um, I see it. I've, I've seen it for years. I still see it. And there's a little bit of a progression. So check this out. There's there's the guy who's resistant. He's talking. He's like, no, 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 no. Right. He was dug in and he shuts up. Mm. And I've seen it. I saw it in church. I saw that guy move from the third row to the back row. He just stops talking. But, but, so I know I'm kind of contradicting my point of silence, but silence never stays silent. Right. It takes the form of silence. It looks like it's silent and it is silent for a while, but I'm telling you, that guy goes to the water cooler that guy goes to the parking lot. That guy goes home and gets on his email. And eventually, silence becomes the absolute obliteration of Ephesians 4, what you just read. Mm-hmm. It, it's not wholesome. It, he, it, it starts to tear down. It starts to you know, try to bring down. It's just, it's ugly. So, But yes, usually if, if you hold your ground against the resistant, there's this period where they just say, okay, fine, I'm out. And that's not what we need. No. We don't need your arms folded and you saying, I'm not going to contribute. Mm-hmm. We just need you to contribute in a healthy way. I think in a lot of ways, our, the citizens of our country are oftentimes silent yeah. when they shouldn't be. Right. And then things go like a completely yeah. different direction yep. than what the majority believe in yep. many times. Right. And it's a result of being silent. Right. Yep. Um, One of the most important things, uh, it seems, to coaches uh, in sports Mm -hmm. is a lack of silence. They want 
everybody communicating all yes. the time. Uh, it's, it's a huge deal in volleyball. Yeah. Uh, will Robbins will say you cannot over communicate. Right. Um, we had a team one year of uh, coaching varsity high school basketball that was filled with uh, silent personalities, yeah. uh, real quiet. And so an assistant coach came up with this idea. She said, I really think to get them out of this, we need them to come to practice and talk for an hour and a half or two hours and say what they're doing the whole time. I said, well, like, what do you mean? She goes, I'm going to get a bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you serious? Oh, she that's said, yes. great. And I'm telling you, after a uh, couple weeks yeah. of over-communicating everything that you're doing, yeah. uh, they kind of got out of that a little bit. Yep. Um, there's times when, I guess, you know, silence is a good thing. We talk mm -hmm. about solitude, meditation, yeah. all that, but that's not what you're talking about here. You're talking about yeah. a stubborn silence. I'm just... So, yeah, solitude is a, is a holy silence. Mm. Yeah, what we're talking about here is an unhealthy silence yeah. because it's got an agenda. Yeah. And it's silent because it's not getting its way. Yeah, got an agenda. Yep. I'd like that. Resistance, silence, collusion. Collusion. Popular word today. It's been in the news a lot. It has. <laughs> yeah. You uh, talked about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Yeah. I think I looked up collusion when, you know, after the election. <laughs> <laughs> I started trying to understand the actual meaning of the word. And, you know, you can Webster it sometime or, you know, whatever online. But it really is. It's it's coming together. It's partnering with another for the, for the sole purpose of the demise of another. So you've got this kind of this trying. I mean, you've got these, it's not just one. It's, it's him or her working with another to bring, to bring them down. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sometimes when you're resistant and it doesn't work and you're silent, and it doesn't work, then you decide to go get some help in your endeavor. And you go recruiting almost to now you're going to get your way. Now you're going to fight this thing in numbers. Yeah. Uh, and you start, you start working together toward a dishonest or an unproductive or an unhealthy or an ungodly, you know, end. So yeah, the Ananias and Sapphira thing was just, that's just aw I hate reading that story. <laughs> I've always hated that story. It's just so sad and it's just, you know, such a hard ending. But yeah, these, this guy and his wife colluded. They, they came together to try and pull one over on, you know, the apostles or, you know, God, and it didn't work. They were all selling their properties and giving uh, to the group. Yep. And they, they held uh, back. They talk to each other and say, hey, yeah, we're yep. going to tell them we sold it for less. Yeah. Our 500 is our, yeah, that's that. Our 500 is, is, is what we should be giving. And, and God knew that wasn't what they should be giving. And, and they die. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, a Christian uh, school principal tell me one time, um, he was dealing mainly in the secondary and the elementary principal wasn't there that day. And, uh, he had to deal with a first grader, I think, who had lied. Yeah. So the kid comes walking in his office and he's feeling a little spunky that day. The principal, and he said, Johnny, I want to tell you about Acts 5. <laughs> <laughs> he said the oh, kid's eyes got good. real big. Yeah. <laughs> he he should have had guys with tarps over, <laughs> over in the corner. He said he never lied again. That's funny. That is just awesome. And I'll say this about collusion. I think those <laughs> who collude, I think they're, um, that's not good. That's unhealthy. It's not productive. Shame on them. A lot of times, just kind of trying to tie some of this together. A lot of times I, I notice in corporate settings, even in nonprofit settings, you get people colluding because leadership is out of touch. Yeah. Because, because the guy, the gal running the things in the corner office, the door shut and there's mm. not intimacy and there's not, you know, proximity and mm -hmm. yeah. So does that make sense? Yes. So sometimes I, I understand it. It doesn't mean it's right, nor should we practice it. It's a virus uh, that really is kind of a subset, a sub-virus of, of another one. So, yeah, you got to be you got to be careful with that. When I think about how you're defining collusion, um, it, 
it's like the people who are colluding are not buying in mm -hmm. to the expression of the given vision, mission, or values. There you go. And they're seeing it a different, different way. way. Yeah. So maybe uh, to get buy-in on the front side yeah. would help yes. reduce some of this. Yeah. I guess it's a bell curve on people that will respond to change. It's yeah. like you got the front leaders and then... Early adapters. Yeah. Yep. Late adapters. But I, think, I just think that's worth saying. Sometimes they're colluding because you did a really bad job of casting vision. Mm. And you did a really poor job of getting buy-in. And you've done a poor job of being with them. So they feel distant. They feel alone. They don't know where you're going. So they collude. That's just, that's just one possibility. Sometimes you've done a fantastic job and they've just got really bad attitudes and they need to be dealt with. Man, I think you can think of about any company that's had some kind of uh, conflict and division. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely uh, three of the four so far are progressions of what happens. Always there. present and usually one after the other. Yeah. Resistant, silent, uh, colluding. The fourth is cynicism. This is... Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, I think it was um, one theologian had a continuum. Uh, we kind of abbreviated it to uh, skeptic, seeker, surrendered, but he had on the front end uh, cynic. cynic. Yeah. Yep. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, just as in fact you are doing. Encourage one another, build up each other, or build each other up, just as in fact you are doing, uh, not being yeah. cynical. Yep. It sounds kind of corny, and, and I suppose it is in some ways, but if you can kind of get away from the corniness of it, it's actually pretty profound when... Uh, our kids were, when our kids were young, you know, we used to say to them, what do you love about the birds? In other words, what do you love about each other? Mm. There's the five of them, the two of us, the seven of us. You know, we used to say, what do you love about the birds? And we, and we just wanted them to say everything. Mm. We love everything. I love everything about him and sisters and brothers. I love everything, you know. And we knew that there would be days when they didn't, but we wanted there to always be this kind of inborn, kind of drilled down deep sense of, um, yeah, this is a positive deal and we're for this family and we are with this family and we love mom and dad and we love our brothers and sisters. And I know, again, it sounds kind of corny, but that cynicism, you know, that negativity, uh, if it's allowed to foster, uh, man, it's really deadly. It's really mm -hmm. dangerous. And the opposite, you know, that, that positivity, that hopefulness, that sense of optimism that always, you know, giving you the benefit of the doubt. It's a powerful thing in a family, in a company, in a church. Um, it can do amazing things if it's allowed to really blossom. It's interesting you juxtapose cynicism with hope. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who hope in the Lord yeah. will renew their strength. There you go. So you, now you have a thriving organization. They will soar right. on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Yep. Can you think of a cynic in your life at any time um, and how he or she made you feel? You know, there were a few cynics when I decided to um, kind of make the move that I made. You know, there were things going on in my personal life. There was stuff going on with our family. We felt like it was a good time after a fantastic 27 years, a good time to explore kind of a new, a new realm of ministry, if you will, even though it wouldn't be in the in the local church and uh, started talking about corporate coaching and started talking about leadership development on the, in the corporate sector side of things. And there were a couple people who just said, you know, what do you know about that? Mm. Why would you, you know, why would you ever make that kind of a jump or that kind of a leap? Why don't you just do what you do? You know, that kind of message. Yeah. Uh, very cynical, yeah. very negative, you know, and, and uh, it kind of scares you a little yeah. bit. It gives you, you know, a little moment of pause. But um, yeah, but I, I love the verse you just read. There was a real hope in me. There was an optimism that what I felt God was doing and where I felt God was leading 
there was actually some possibility. So, so cynicism breeds uh, negativity, uh, frustration, and fear. Yeah, I would say absolutely with what you're saying all the time. We've talked about um, resistance, mm-hmm. silence, um, collusion, mm-hmm. cynicism. What's the answer? Yeah. What does a healthy organization do to kill those viruses? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting when you think about, you know, when you think about resistance, um, <clears throat> it's certainly going to be there. I don't think you need to <clears throat> focus on trying to figure out some kind of strategy for there to never be any resistance. So I think the virus of resistance in some ways is almost a given. I think you've got to have a plan on how you're going to respond to that. Because a lot of leaders, a lot of coaches, a lot of dads and moms, when they see resistance, it's just like, boom. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have a plan for resistance. How are you going to engage it? Still leading with courage, still leading forward with vision, but how are you going to engage or try to engage the resistor in a way that gives them a a chance to share their thought, you know, articulate their perspective, um, but move forward? Now, that takes time. (laughs) and effort, and heart, and a lot of leaders don't want to do that. Mm -mm. Um, Silence, you know, I used the example of the guy moving from the third row to the back row. You could literally, or you you see, or figuratively, you know as a leader when somebody checks out. Yeah. So what do you do? I, I don't know that you can avoid that, but to your question, how do we deal with these four viruses? How are you going to, I love the word, we've used it for years. How are you going to pursue a silent person? You see it, you know it, it's happening, they're checking out. And are you going to at least take the time to go and invite them to speak in a healthy way, Mm. but nonetheless, you know, break their silence? Mm. Um, Yeah, collusion, I think you have to, I think collusion you have to face head on. I think, I don't, yeah, I don't think you can write letters or emails. I don't think you can hope it passes. When you've got people working together against you, then it's time to have a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's time to sit down and close the door and invite their co- their collusion to just kind of come up on the table and, and uh, let's not do it in the back hallways. Let's just do it face to face. What about a cynic? I think with a, with, with a cynic, you have to invite them to what the passage in Isaiah <clears throat> said. You have to invite the cynic to hope. People are cynical. Usually people are cynical for a lot of reasons, and it's usually very deep and longstanding, and I I get it. Um, Sometimes it's better to part with a cynic. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that like in a bad way, but just sometimes that's just not. That's Well, Proverbs says, you know, when the mocker goes out, everything gets better. Everything comes to life. Mm -hmm. So I'd be careful with that one, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I think sometimes the cynic thing is a pretty bad deal. Okay, let's call this a Holy Spirit moment because what just came to me as you were talking, it really lines up with with 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And I think this is a real secret um, tucked away in Paul's letter of how to lead uh, difficult people through listening, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, this is kind of a combination of different translations for us to get it, but it's to confront the unruly, Mm -hmm. Comfort the timid, support the weak, be patient with all. Yes. We have a tendency to confront the timid and comfort the unruly. Right. And when you started talking about it takes a meeting, um, we got to confront means face to face, and we got to actually get face to face, not a text, not an email, Mm -hmm. not a letter, um, not a social media messaging. But we've got to get face-to-face, and things are so much different yeah. when the confronting is face-to-face with the unruly person, wherever they are on there, yep. you know, wh- however much it's progressed. Yeah, um, that's really good, Mitch. And then the comfort means to come alongside and strengthen mm-hmm. somebody else. Yep. And you mentioned that, especially when they're silent. Right. you got to come take a little initiative and, mm-hmm. and help them to speak wisely in a, in a yes. way that can benefit the whole Use organization. Their voice well. Because you mentioned tension. Tension is like, can be good. It's the okay. first part of conflict. And if you deal with everything in the tension mode, then you don't get into the, all the other uh, heavier stuff. Yeah. Um, That's good. 
and then uh, support the weak. That's kind of like a weak in willpower. Mm -hmm. um, they might need a little guidance and and feel supported. There are a lot of people that if they don't feel supported, they will disengage from an organization overnight. Yep, um, That's a big deal to them. And then finally, uh, be patient with everyone. I, I think that is an active thing, not a passive thing. I think a lot of times we think patience means, okay, I don't do anything. No, but we got to... We got to understand, like you said, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. It's a process, so be patient. Yeah. Um, I've got a friend, uh, you know him, a doctor friend, who heard the, the talk I did on the viruses. And it was just really insightful afterwards. He said, don't forget. And it was really great. He said, a virus. He said, you know, like when you have a sore throat, when you and I get strep or whatever, we go get a pack and boom. Mm -hmm. He said, viruses aren't that way. You... You wait out viruses. You treat them, but viruses don't. Yeah, a virus isn't like done like that. Mm. Uh, a virus is something that's pretty serious. It's pretty insidious. You can treat it. There's ways to help it go. But yeah, it takes time. Yeah, it's not just quick. Mm. So as we talk about your question, was the question how do we how do we deal with these four viruses? You better have your sleeves rolled up, and you better be willing to go through a process and lead well. Amen. Thank you so much yeah. uh, for being here. You bet, man. Great and to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and your organization, whether it's your family, your church, or your business. Uh, maybe it's your hobby or your sport. And you ask, are these four viruses kind of taken hold? Um, is there resistance, silence? Uh, collusion, cynicism, and surrender those to God. But take heart that there is hope that God will use you. It's a process. And you can confront the unruly. You can comfort the timid. You can support the weak. You can be patient with all. And God will use you to lead wisely Amen. and leave no one behind. When leaders come together, like at the Global Leadership Summit, it's amazing what can happen because everything will be multiplied at an exponential level. So a leader gets a, a nugget of learning and he starts to apply it and assimilate it into his culture. And then everybody wins by applying that nugget of learning. The Global Leadership Summit is one of the greatest things to ever happen to our community.